Uh, hello folks, today we're doing Gridland Metro. This is a medium difficulty problem on HackerRank. Um, my usual format is I'll cover, I'll go over the question, I'll give you some time to do it on your own, and then I'll go over my solution. Let's check it out. Uh, the city of Gridland is represented as a, an N by M matrix where the rows are numbered from 1 to N and the columns are numbered 1 to M. Gridland has a network of train tracks and always runs in straight horizontal lines along a row. In other words, the start and end points of a track are a row uh, given a column one and a row given column two, where R represents the row number. C1 represents the starting column and C2 represents the ending column. Uh, the mayor is surveying the city to determine the number of locations where a lamppost can, can be placed. A lamppost can be placed on any cell that is not occupied by a train track. Given a map and its K train tracks, find, a, find and print the number of cells where the mayor can place lamppost. So the number of cells where they can. So this is just a count thing. Uh, note, a train track may overlap other trains within the same row. Okay, so that's something to consider. Uh, so I'm going to give a, a quick example just to be super crystal clear because this was not very clear in the instructions for me. Um, so what could happen here is that you're given a row, a column start, and column end. And if you're on a 4x4 four four grid, that's basically saying row 2, which is this row here. I've colored it, I colored uh, this in, in red. The start is column two and the end is column three. So that's this these two red blocks right here, basically. Um, then you can go to row three and that goes from one to four. So that's one, two, three, four. That's these four right there. Um, and then you can have row four with a start and end on the four, which is this one block here, basically. What you can also have, which was not super clear to me, is that you can have tracks that go kind of backwards. Um, so the column start is three for row two. So we're going back to another row. And by the way, they can overlap. So this is totally a valid um, train track where the column goes from three to one. So you're going kind of backwards three to one going this way. What I ended up doing was just, or what I recommend doing is just kind of flipping the two. If you see that situation, if the column start is greater than the column end, just flip them and you kind of get the same situation. Um, but um, in the end here, we have four uh, so our eight blocks that are covered, and so we have 16 total spots, which are and we're eight are taken up, so that's 16 minus eight or eight empty blocks. So this is the answer for this would be just returning the number eight. All right, hope that was clear. Uh, I'll give you some time to do it on your own, and we'll come back with my solution. Okay, so for my solution, I uh, one, one small caveat here is I changed the name uh, of the variable called from track to tracks, plural, because it's a list of tracks, uh, individual items that are an individual track. Anyway, um, so what I wanted to do was kind of keep track of each row by itself, and I was going to have a hard time doing that without them being in some kind of sorted form. So what I ended up doing was sorting not by the rows, but actually by the um, by the columns, the column start. But like I mentioned before, the column start could also be like the second column, which is the column end, which is kind of annoying. So what I ended up doing here is um, basically sorting by whichever column is the smallest number. So I have here a quick sort. I'm using a lambda function to quickly take a single track and use whichever one is smaller the um so so the thing here is these tracks are coming in so let me just quickly uh so tracks is a list of other lists or tuples which has three items within it um the first element being a row the column start and column end um so i was having a very difficult time dealing with any situation that didn't have things ordered in some way so what i ended up doing was by ordering by the column start we should know that the column start is not always the best number because sometimes it's flipped with the column end. Uh, so I ended up just taking whatever, whichever one was the minimum, basically. So I have here uh, the sorting um, of the tracks, taking each element, and I'm sorting by whichever is smaller, the column start, which is this, or the column end, which is this. Now we have our tracks that are sorted by the column start. And that's going to be important for, for later in a second. Um, but for the most part, I'm now going to just keep a running total of the number of blocks that each track is going to take up. 
and I'm going to be careful not to overlap or I'm going to keep track of what's being overlapped basically and the fact that I have the tracks sorted is what's going to allow me to do that so one thing to keep note here is that our con time complexity here at this point is n log n just because of the sorting um, but okay so another thing I'm going to keep track of are the rows themselves and so what I'll be doing here is because things are sorted by column start I basically have an interval that anytime I encounter the next interval I'll know that it either started at the same point or after that point so that's what I'll be uh, that's what that's an important piece of information um, but here I'll be keeping track of a dictionary of the rows so each row will have a, a key here once we see it and um, basically the thing I'm keeping track of for each row is the last column so for example if I have a uh, a new track that starts at 1 and ends at 5 I'm keeping track of the 5 because that's the that's the information I need the next time I see another interval for that specific row if I see an interval that starts before the 5 then I know there's some overlap and I can just calculate whatever whatever that overlap is and I update my last index um, and I add whatever the overlap is to the total basically um, if I find that the next interval I see for that specific row is it starts after my last index which was the ending index that's like this is the overlap for that it was previously seen or I'm gonna actually on your screen is probably like this okay so this is the last interval seen and it ends here and I see a new interval that starts well after it that begins here then I know there is no overlap and because things are sorted by starting um, by the starting column that I know that there is nothing in between that could possibly have happened so I can kind of like ignore this one now and now I, I'll use this and I'll just add this total this span to the total and now this is my last index scene and I'll just keep doing that for each row specifically um, okay so that's the code I'm gonna do now so I'm looping once again through the tracks but this time remember the tracks are in sorted order so this is big O of n these things are sorted but we're gonna grab the row column start and column end again I need to orient my tracks to be in the kind of like a sensible way so I'm gonna keep my column starts and ends in the right way if my column end is before my column start I know that's that weird situation where I just want to flip them and that's all I'm doing in this one line here um, Python is nice because you can do that in one line um, that's like one of the <laughs> maybe one of the only benefits for Python but I don't know um, anyway so once we have that sorted out now we can kind of do that logic I mentioned so I'm going to grab the row from uh, our our running dictionary here called last column end by rows um, if that row does not exist at that point then I know this is a new row um, being added and I can just say okay hey column uh, add the row and then make sure that the column end is the the last one that's updated there and I can take my running total and just add the difference between the column end and column start um, and I need to add one because of the math it just it's, it's like a one-off thing but that's basically it um, you you keep a running total because that's a new that's a totally new interval being added that whole thing is valid to, to add um, so that's if it's new if it's not new then we know okay this is a row that we've seen before so we need to have our little slightly different logic here we need to grab the last row sorry we need to grab the the, the, um, the last column for that row and we need to check something okay we say okay hey last uh, column are you less than the column start if that is the case that's a situation where it's a completely new interval that has no overlap we can kind of just we can ignore the old uh, interval that we're keeping track of and just like say hey this is a new thing and we just update the last column n for that row to that current column n and we add basically the the whole interval to the the, the running total the other the other situation is that the the um, last column is less than the column end so what does that mean if we're in a situation where that last like the kind of like we're keeping track of this like uh, running interval basically the last one if the column end is greater than that that means that the column start was overlapping so there's basically the situation of an overlap 
So that's the thing we need to consider. We need to basically subtract whatever is in the middle and only take care of the new stuff. Um, and that's what we need to do here. So that's what this code is doing. We are still updating the last the last column for that row to be the column end. We're just like taking this interval and basically adding to it. And now this is going to be the new interval, the new ending. Um, and we're going to now add whatever the overlap was, which is the column end, which is a little bit ahead of the last the, the last one, and subtracting whatever the last one is, because we're just like adding whatever is the, the new stuff basically, and we're adding that to the running total. Um, Otherwise, the only, the only other situation left over is for the current track to be completely within the previous span. So that means it's already accounted for. That means we don't need to we don't need to do anything basically. So um, that's a that's a, a situation where we just say continue. Um, I am fully aware that this code is not efficient. You know, there's this repeated code here over and over again. It's the same thing. You see it. It's getting highlighted, right? Um, there are more efficiencies that you can certainly put into the literal code. I'm trying to make this as clear as possible for people watching this. So that's why it's like not super efficient. I don't care about efficiency. I care about you understanding what's going on. So you can make it efficient on your own. I encourage you to do that. And then once you do that, you're going through each track to do that. And at the end, you will have a running total. That is the number of blocks that are taken up. You say, I'm going to take N times M. Uh, which is our you know the total number of blocks and subtract the running total which is the blocks that are taken up by the, tr the tracks and you get your answer so let's check this one out okay and let's run it let's run some code or submit some code let's submit some code hey look at that very nice um all right let's quickly go over some time complexity um so i saw before we had the sorting was n log n for sure. Um, the uh, running through the tracks once it's sorted is big O of n. So in the end, the total complexity is big O of n log n. It's just the sorting. The sorting step was the one that the one that took the most time. So I hope that was helpful, folks. If you find this kind of content helpful, please make sure to like, subscribe, and do all the good things. And I'll see you next time. Take care.